Yo, what's good guys? Today we got American cities versus European cities. What's the difference? Let's find out, man. Honestly, I'm not gonna lie. I think I haven't seen a European city in person, but honestly, there's something cool about like the oldness of the European cities that always interests me, so this should be fun. The United States and Europe both have large urban populations and deep cultural ties, but their respective cities have some distinct differences. For starters, there is a significant age gap between European and American cities. When Europeans first arrived in the Americas in the late 15th and early 16th centuries, there were as many as 10 million natives living in what is today the United States. But the natives were not concentrated in large urban settlements like the civilizations in what is today Mexico and Central and South America. If there had been, you can only speculate on what would have happened to them. There are some exceptions though. The oldest continuous settlements in the United States belong to natives and are located in the southwest United States. These settlements were founded around I never knew about this on 1100 AD, but they generally have never hosted more than a few thousand people. Damn. The largest known native settlement in the United States hosted as many as 18,000 natives. This city, called Cahokia, was located in what is today the state of Illinois. What? Just minutes from from the modern day city of St. Louis. Wait, a, wait, 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 wait. I'm from there. Hold on. Hold on now. What? I'm from Illinois. You're telling you're telling me like the oldest city in America that had 18,000 people or at least the biggest oldest one is in my st Yo, that's stuck. Okay, I got to visit that at some point. I have to Where where is it? Kanoka? I'm, I'm bright. Hold on now. Hold on now. Quick little picture for future. I gotta visit that at some point. That's sweet. I never knew that was. That's a little out of my way. St. Louis is a couple hours away from me, but. As many. When I get the chance, I gotta go see that. Is 18,000 natives. This city, called Cahokia, was located in what is today the state of Illinois, and just minutes from the modern day city of St. Louis. But I've been was to St. Louis the before, I've never heard of that. The ten largest cities in the United States, on average, were settled around the early to mid-18th century, while Europe's ten largest cities are hundreds and sometimes thousands of years older. See, like, that's Europe's what's ten largest me. cities by population are, on average, larger than American cities when counting the residents within city limits. Out of Europe's ten largest cities by population, none have less than two million people. But in the United States... Six of its top ten have less than two million people. That's crazy to me, too. European cities also have a higher population density. Out of Europe's ten most populated cities, only three have a density of less than 10,000 people per square mile. St. Petersburg, Russia, Kiev, Ukraine, and Rome, Italy. The city with the highest density is Paris, with 53,000 people per square mile, nearly twice as many people as the United States' densest city, New York with 28,000 people per square mile. After New York City, it drops off pretty quickly. The second most populated city in the US, Los Angeles, has 85 I thought, I thought the second was Chicago. Huh? 500 people per square mile. Isn't Chicago the second? Chicago, 12,000 people per okay, square so mile. Okay, so we're third. Houston. Let's go. Shout out Chicago. I'm not really much of a big city person, but you know, I got to rep the one that's in my state like you know, if I'm going to, even though, to be fair, I would never want to live in Chicago. 3,500 people per square mile, and Phoenix, 3,100 people per square mile. The differences in European and U.S. cities' populations and densities are largely due to American suburbs. People are living outside of city limits and in homes instead of multi-storied structures. These yeah. suburbs initially came about because of the train. They then exploded with the wider use of the car and cheap fuel that powered them. Land outside of American cities was also cheap, making homes affordable for the middle class. Chicago is often credited with inventing the suburb. Really? After the fire of 1874, the city banned the construction of wood buildings. So speculators built cheap wooden homes as fast as they could just outside of Chicago for the 100,000 people that were just left homeless. I never knew Chicago is like the home of the suburbs, like where it all. That's crazy. Why am I learning so much about like my state? What the? 
After World War II, the federal government started guaranteeing loans that required 20% or less for a down payment and loan lengths as long as 30 years. Before this, it was common to have to make a 50% down payment with loan lengths as short as 5 to 10 years. These new loans increased the amount of people that could purchase a home, but these loans had more favorable terms for new construction compared to existing housing since the government did not want to back a loan on a house that may have issues. Fair. This meant it was easier to get a new home in the suburbs than a property close to the city center, which was typically older. However, African Americans were often discriminated against when it came to these lines, so few were able to move to the suburbs. While mortgage discrimination has improved significantly, the discrimination that occurred from the 40s to the 60s contributed to generational poverty, and it has had a lasting impact on the geography of American cities. African Th there's truth to that. There's definitely truth to that part. I, I got it. I can agree with that. Americans are still less likely to be living in the suburbs than whites, though the demographics are slowly changing. Today, more African Americans actually live in the suburbs at 39% than within city limits at 36%. Oh, damn. The mass exodus in many of these cities, often referred to as white flight, led to severe urban decay. Residential buildings were abandoned leading to yep. local businesses Detroit got Detroit's literally dying because of that I know about that shutting their doors due to less customers which resulted in job losses which led to poverty and crime which led to more people leaving this cycle continues in many cities today while others have seen an urban revival in the last couple of decades as many young professionals move back to the city however where wealthier people in the United States tend to live in the suburbs in Europe, wealthier individuals are more likely to live in the city center. Take a look at this map of the London... I wonder... Wait, but I wonder why that is. Like, why is it that more rich people prefer to live in the city in Europe versus in the U.S.? They wouldn't. Like, because for me, if I had unlimited money, I'd be living in the opposite of the city. I've said it too many times now. Y'all already know. But, like, <laughs> I'd be living in the middle of nowhere. Underground which shows the average income of the neighborhoods that use each stop. The highest incomes are at the center of the city, and the lowest incomes are at the farthest stops from the center. Speaking of public transportation, Europe's public transportation systems are usually thought of as superior to the United States, with a few exceptions like New York City. Because of the suburbs, U.S. cities are too spread out, and buses and trains can't stop at every block to pick everyone up. If they did, it would run extremely slow. When it comes to roads, both the United States and Europe have extensive major road networks. But in the United States, large roads often run right through its cities yep. instead of up to it. While this may make sense in trying to quickly travel from state to state or city to city, it is often criticized for splitting neighborhoods and disrupting local communities. Another thing that separates European and U.S. cities are the amount of skyscrapers. United States cities generally have more skyscrapers. Out of 50 cities in the world with the most skyscrapers, only two are in Europe. Moscow, Russia with 57 skyscrapers, and Frankfurt, Germany tied for 50th with 17. The United States has 11 cities in the top 50, with the most going to New York City with 287 skyscrapers. Damn! When European cities do have skyscrapers, they tend to have a section designated for them, away from their historic city center. See, that's what I was thinking, is like, the reason Europeans have less skyscrapers is probably because most of your buildings are, like, from before skyscrapers were even a thing. Like La Defense, a business district, which is actually... And, like, I also imagine you guys don't want to take away from the old school buildings, too, by putting a bunch of skyscrapers right next to them, so... Actually a few miles outside of Paris itself. The skyscraper was first born in the United States in the late 19th century. The first in Chicago and later in New York. Yo! Okay, alright. I'm not even going to try to over-exaggerate that one. I knew that. I, I knew the first one was in Chicago with that one, so... I, I ain't even going to bullshit y'all. But! Still, yo! Why is my state and my, like, big city in my state being named so much today in this video? The United States took pride in their large structures, seeing them as a symbol of their prosperity and power. Europe, on the other hand, already had established historic buildings and public spaces that left little room for large new structures. They were also resistant to what could be considered American. After the destruction of European cities in the Second World War, 
Europe had the chance to build whatever they wanted. They could redesign their cities around the car as American cities were starting to, and now had room to build skyscrapers. But Europe chose not to. Europe had an overwhelming desire to build their cities back to the way they were before the war and to preserve their unique cultures and way of life. The city of Brussels... I'm going to be honest, I think that's a good thing. I do. Like, I think that is cool that you guys kind of kept the old school kind of look of your guys' cities instead of trying to copy the U.S. cities. Like, And honestly, as time goes on, it looks like it served you guys very well. Brussels also played a role in the rest of Europe protecting its urban landscape. The city of Brussels had a laissez-faire approach to urban planning in the 1960s to the 1980s. Structures that were often generic and didn't fit in with Brussels' historic city landscape were put all over the city. The rest of Europe took notice and became concerned a similar randomness of structures could be placed all over their respective cities. Zoning laws that protected- Even though, let's be honest, this bridge looks so cool. This bridge looks badass. This, like, egg place here look- I'm pretty sure this is London, right? This egg place here looks badass. Like- Europe's historic districts and structures were then passed across the continent. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe for other geography related topics. Thank Honestly, this was a cool video. So if you guys enjoyed this reaction, subscribe, ring the bell, you know how YouTube works, like the video, and uh, let me know what you'd like me to watch next. I'm out. Bye. <laughs>